Hi, I'm Roger and this is Jacob and we're going to talk to you about uh, things that governments and corporations have done to try to censor the Tor network over the past couple of years. So we start out with sort of a very quick overview of what's going on and we're going to try to get directly to the more interesting material. So a brief background about Tor, we've got something like 500,000 or 400,000 people using Tor right now. Part of the goal is to have a diverse set of people so that we've got cancer survivors and activists and militaries and corporations and everybody in between blending together on the same network. So this is a short overview of the anonymity side of Tor. We've got Alice, she's trying to browse the web to some website or destination Bob, and the adversary could be somewhere watching Alice, watching Bob, watching the middle in between. So over the past couple of years, we've had quite a bit of growth in the number of relays, but this is actually not the right slide to look at. The right slide to look at is not the number of relays, but the amount of capacity we have. So it's gone from a little under 500 megabytes per second of capacity to almost two gigabytes per second of capacity over the past couple of years. And the load on the network is also going up pretty much to keep, to keep pace with the capacity growth, which is good news for the number of people who are being kept safe, but bad news for performance because we need even more capacity. I remember several years ago, I was being interviewed by a journalist who the first question they had was, so how are you doing against China? And I had to, to back up and say, no, 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 I'm writing software. There are people in China who are doing against China. You should ask them how they are doing. But it should not be up to me how China changes. We write tools to let people all around the world change the world in the way that they think their world needs to be changed. So our story starts in 2002 when we first did the release of Tor. Um, we wrote the design paper, published it in 2004. At that point, censorship wasn't even on the horizon. We were thinking of this as an anonymity tool. We need to be able to get lots of different users being using the same network at the same time. We hadn't thought at all about what happens when corporations or governments or other tools try to prevent people from reaching the anonymity system. So back in the early days of 2002, 2004, there really wasn't much, uh, nobody was thinking about censorship and governments trying to block these sorts of things. So the very first step was Thailand in April 2006. I got mail from some people in Thailand saying, uh, I live in a democratic country and they filter the internet and they just filter your website, this sucks. I'm going to sue, there's a constitution that says they're not supposed to do that. So they ended up doing it by DNS filtering. Um, only certain ISPs bought into this, so only some people who were in Thailand got censored. They ended up doing a redirection to a page that doesn't exist anymore. Um, the only certain ISPs bought into it reminds me of a bunch of other countries out there. Sweden, for example, there are certain ISPs who are thinking about buying into the censorship list. So that's a theme that we will see over and over. This is a, an example of, I think, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, I posted online that I was looking for people to tell us whether or not the Tor Project website was blocked in their country. So in the upper left, the bomb site is not trusted, and the upper right, the, I don't know, coffee or lava lamp thing. Uh, that's the United Arab Emirates. Uh, in, the, in, the back, uh, in the background, we actually see uh, Kuwaiti. On the left, I think that that is also Kuwait. In the middle, that's the Sultanate of Amman, and on the right, I believe it's Saudi Arabia, so you'll notice they're blocked. The bottom right, this is, I think, uh, kind of an amazing thing here. Um, they're trying to tell you, you know, that this, this site has been blocked, this is in Qatar, and they're trying to make it fun, <laughs> right? And if you feel this is an error, feel free to send them an email. They're trying to contextualize this in inherently fucked up thing that they're doing, which is restricting the right to read, to be clear, and they're trying to make it fun. They're trying to make it like, oh, yeah, this is not a targeted sort of, you know, population control idea, this is uh, hilarious, oops. <laughs> It's fascinating, though, because some places don't even do that, right? They have a very different relationship where they're trying, you know, to do, do some kinds of mind control, essentially. And in this case, they at least are pretending, which is significantly different than some of these, maybe. Although the top two from the UAE sure are cute. So Smart Filter was the first corporation that started working on this censorship stuff. We say Smart Filter here because it is Smart Filter. 
There's no mistake about this. This is an American corporation, which I think, who owns this after the chain of yeah, acquisitions? So, smart so we went to Tunisia in October and we talked to the fellow who runs the Tunisian internet agency. And he said, yes, we did renew our smart filter license for another year. So it's great that he actually explicitly is willing to tell people that his government purchased censorship and surveillance software from a Western corporation and they use it. And he brought up the phrase national sovereignty because he said, we don't censor anymore in our country, except for the governments and the military and the schools. But, but, but that's because they want it. And that was a kind of a weird conversation. And at that point, we started to realize, so you outsource your censorship and surveillance to some corporation, maybe in France, you won't tell us which one, and then they manage Smart Filter. So Smart Filter sold to Secure Computing a few years ago, and Secure Computing sold to McAfee a few years ago, and McAfee sold to Intel this year. So Intel operates the surveillance and censorship system for the Tunisian military, and they probably don't even know it. That's fucked up. Okay, so we move forward a little bit. Uh, those were the good days when people censored by port number or something like that. Uh, China is a little bit trickier. So in September of 2009, right before the 60th anniversary of some guy becoming in charge in China, they did a whole lot of blocking of lots of different circumvention tools. Um, this is um, another view on the time that China, the very first time, the 60th anniversary of some dude getting into power in China. So. This is a relay that I run in Amsterdam, and it on, basically it was one of the faster relays in the network for a time. And one day we went from approximately 10,000 users connecting from China on a daily basis, basically to zero. And that little bump in the graph is either an error, uh, like an error in our data set, or maybe it's when their censorship system wasn't quite working. It's important to realize the censorship systems in some places are very centralized in the same way that the ITU is centralized. You have a central telephone company and they have central filtering and that's sort of the edge of the country and you think about it like a perimeter security system so it doesn't work very well. And China has that plus each ISP gets a phone call or an email saying don't embarrass us, you know, make sure you filter this stuff. And so in some cases, some ISPs have additional filtering or they are responsible for doing the filtering. And then there's also the edges. And so this might be a case where there was a, I think the term they use is harmonization. There was not harmonization between the filters in China. And then they sort of ironed that out. And this is what happened the same time. So just to show you that graph again, it used to be that users would download a new circumvention system, the whole binary, the entire shebang, whenever they got blocked. And I went to Hong Kong and a couple of other places, in Shenzhen and so into the mainland, and I talked with people and I said, hey, you don't actually have to download a copy of Tor. You can just plug in a bridge IP. And one of the people I talked with was an extremely well-known blogger, and he said, hey, Google and a bunch of places are about to get blocked. Install Tor today. If it stops working, use Bridges. Here's how you use Bridges. So they blocked Tor, and that's what happened. <laughs> right? I mean, to get kind of sentimental about it, this is sort of the triumph of the human spirit over censorship here. You got 10,000, and then you like peak. Like They realized that they were empowered to do something, and then they did it. What Jake was talking about the good, was the good news, with some users disappear from the direct relays, and then lots of people use bridges. The problem here is once China blocked the second strategy of bridges, suddenly it was very hard to, in an automated way, if you don't know somebody, get to learn about another bridge. But yeah, this is bad news for Tor in China right now. Uh, basically, China is kicking our ass at the arms race. And uh, we'll see some slides later on that show that it's even worse than this. Oh, great. I, I would say we, we might frame it sometimes as China is kicking our asses. But really, let's be honest here. What is happening is that China is oppressing their citizens and restricting their right to read. And their citizens have clearly got a desire here. And it's important to note that we have been here before. And since we're talking about timelines, I would like to go back to approximately 5th century BC, or whatever you want to call it. So this is important because it turns out that sometimes there's a relationship between real truth, like an objective thing, and how people of the day see that truth. 
So in this case, there was a guy who showed that the square root of two was a different class of numbers than the Pythagoreans appreciated, and they drowned him at sea, right? Well, it turns out that Iran is repeating this story. And the reason that they are doing that is because, as I said earlier, they took the parameter P from our Diffie-Hellman handshake, and they basically said, if we see a TCP flow that includes this, this number, we're going to kill the TCP connection. We are going to say that that is not all right. So I was joking with Roger, instead of irrational numbers, we've created liberation numbers. And these numbers are being drowned at sea by different governments and corporations all around the world. So there's actually a number right now. If you send that number after making an SSL connection in Iran, your connection gets killed. Which is also kind of funny if you think about what you could do with JavaScript and websites. But <laughs> ironically, they, they very clearly were targeting us. And if you, if you look at things like the DigiNotar debacle or other cases where some Iranians have really owned up a bunch of certificate authorities that kind of deserved it, they, they, they very clearly have people that are working on this. Ironically, SOX proxying, as we note here, it really wasn't. So sometimes when things aren't blocked, there's a reason for it. And that largely comes from the fact that censorship of services is, is an effect that happens as a result of other actions, which is to say that censorship is a second order effect of a surveillance state, right? Because they are watching, then they tamper. They tamper when watching is not enough. So using a straight SOX proxy is fine to let through in some cases because they believe that it doesn't harm things. It doesn't harm their surveillance program. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of leeway here. If you can camouflage your protocol to look like another protocol, then it's very difficult for the classification systems to decide that it's a protocol that needs to be blocked. And lucky for us, the DH parameter P is a server-side parameter, so we just had a patch out in just a few hours, and the relays upgraded, and the whole Tor network worked all over again. And that's what it looked like. Each of these red uh, dots here is a censorship event. And so they actually did these censorship events. You can see three here. You can see that they did them at particular times of the year that are actually, if we were to look at news stories, we would see that there's important political things happening here. So because we were able to get the patch out in a very quick amount of time, we were able to essentially help people who wanted to continue to use Tor, right? So I think the graph peaks at 12,000. So they went from making sure that zero of those 12,000 were able to securely communicate and then we got back up to 12,000. This is around the time, I mean, of course, this is not to take credit in any way for this happening. It's just to say that we're helping to create these alternative communications channels. And in this case, we see that they intentionally knew that something was sensitive, so they went to the trouble of working on blocking Tor. And then in this case, we were able to turn it around quickly enough that the demand was back during that particular time point, because it was sensitive. It was a time when people really thought about needing to be free from surveillance. Because this is a country where, when you log into your Gmail account, if they can do a man-in-the-middle attack on you, they will. And when they do the man-in-the-middle attack, they will take your email address, they will go to your house with the contents of your email, they will grab you, take you to the secret police office, and they will beat the shit out of you and torture you and potentially even murder you for the contents of your email. This is the same thing that's happening in Syria. So they really want to be able to spy on people, and then they prove to those people that they have this total view of your activity online. And Tor threatens that totalitarian control, and that is why they are attacking these things, because they are trying at the same time to attack their citizens specifically. And this gives their citizens something that gives them some of their agency and some of their autonomy, and it returns it. So when you run a Tor relay and you wish you could do something about this kind of stuff happening in the world, this is the kind of graph that should really inspire you to know that when you make a choice to do something like this, it actually does empower those people directly and immediately. And that keeps them safe. Thank you, John. So one other point here, I have a friend uh, who's from Iran and does a bunch of trainings in Iran, and he tries to teach people about a lot of different circumvention tools. And a few years ago, he told me a story that I'm still trying to wrap my head around, which, so he, he said, I do trainings of lots of different tools. I've taught a lot of different people lots of different tools. Everybody that I've taught anything other than Tor to is now in jail. So now I only teach Tor which is a pretty scary statement because we're not perfect, the other ones are not as good, but holy crap, we've got a lot of work to do.
So actually, if you write free software, could you raise your hand? Everybody here? It would be totally awesome if everybody that rose, if you're raising your hand right now, you should really consider coming and volunteering to work on Tor, because you'll make a huge difference in the world when you do that. I mean, no pressure or anything, but if you fuck it up, <laughs> you know? We need, we need good people to check our work. So Egypt, e Egypt is a place that's very near and dear to my heart. I, I did some trainings in the Middle East. I even studied Arabic very, very badly. I'm you know, non-existent. It's much worse than my German. Um, in 2009, and I went, I went to Egypt. I taught people about OTR. I taught people about how to use Jabber. I taught them about various different communication systems and how to use them safely. And at the time, I met some sensors, and they told me, oh, yeah, we use this Cisco gear. We do deep packet inspection on enemies of the state. And yeah, well, you know, I don't think too much about it, but obviously they're bad guys. So this is a pretty serious problem, but we, we tried our best to tell people in Egypt Look, surveillance is a big deal. You don't see it yet, but when you see it, it will be very bad because what someone can do is pretty serious. And so what happened in Egypt, of course, everyone knows, is that there was a revolution. And in fact, it's not that the revolution happened and it stopped on January 25th of this year. Rather, it is the case that the revolution is continuing nonstop, right? So this January 25th revolution is still going on right now to hear, uh, according to some of my friends that are in Cairo, covered with snipers, there are people that are being shot in the eyes. I mean, there's like a real serious thing going on in Egypt. And in the case of Mubarak pulling the plug on the internet, we saw that there was selective filtering. So for example, Twitter was filtered IP address by IP address. And so there was a case where a couple of the IP addresses were not filtered, and you could still sort of intermediate, and you, could, you could sort of reach some of them from some ISPs, and then sometimes you couldn't. But on Telecom Egypt data links, there were two IP addresses which were never filtered, but other ones on the same slash 24 that were. So you could prove without, without any question that they were filtering that right at the DSLAM for the DSL modem. And that's, that's a pretty interesting fact. And in fact, I went to Egypt um, after January 25th again, and I was on a panel with someone from Nokia, Vodafone, Telecom Egypt, the, uh, the head of the communications agency for Egypt, and um, I sat on this panel with them, which was a little bit awkward for them. And I said, you know, now that the dictatorship is gone, I have talked to many people in Egypt that wish to ensure that the Egyptian constitution is something that you respect. So will you agree to never censor the internet again? Will you agree to never send propaganda for whichever regime tries to pop up next? And Vodafone made the usual arguments about pornography and all the other nonsense things about terrorism. And they don't talk about, for example, how their spreading of propaganda is in fact propagating state-based terrorism against individuals that live in Egypt. They just sort of gloss over that. And that's something you can't just stand and listen to. So I, of course, said, well, I have evidence that shows that you actively engaged in censorship. And the telecom <laughs> Egypt executive said, that's not true. You're wrong. And I said, no, no, I have the data, and I'd be happy to provide it in a court of law. I mean, I'm not really a fan of law, but in your case, I'll make an exception. And, <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to provide it. And he said, I'm not saying you're lying. <laughs> uh, but OK. And he stopped arguing with me, because he knew damn well that he had specifically and selectively targeted certain things for censorship and that they had collaborated with the regime. And there would be a time of reckoning. And when that time came, it would not be pretty for him. We got this on videotape, by the way, which is, which is pretty great. Um, but of course, unplugging the internet sort of changes everything. And as we can see here, there is a demand, and then there was a drop. And that's, I mean, that's pretty serious. They basically promised they won't do it again. However, and if you have a Vodafone SIM, you should consider contacting them about this. Vodafone said, we will do whatever the law says. Is, whatever is legal, they will do that. So what they basically said is, no matter what happens, we will do what we are told, regardless of the consequences. It's not because we're afraid we'll be killed. It is because the, our corporate charter is perfectly aligned with the law. Right and wrong go with the law, hand in hand. And I confronted them repeatedly about this, and they continued to say that. That is not an acceptable standard of right and wrong, actually, and certainly not in a dictatorship where the rule of law is not controlled in any way through the consent of the people that are governed by this law. 
And it is really important to drive that home. These, these laws are bullshit, and we should disobey them. And these corporations should be punished by everybody for doing that. So that was January. You'll notice that these slides are showing up more and more closely together at this point. In March, uh, Libya, they didn't cut off the internet in the same way that Egypt did, but they might as well have. So there were a bunch of people who were starting to use it, and then they, they throttled everything. They didn't unplug it in a way that everybody in Egypt freaked out about. They just basically turned down the bandwidth knob so there was nothing left. And there are a few people back using it. Part of the challenge with Libya is they don't really have an internet there to begin with. So you'll notice the numbers here are hundreds of people coming from the Libyan IP space. Another challenge is when you get a GeoIP database, it doesn't really care about Libya very much because the people who build GeoIP databases are building them to sell them to corporations who sell televisions online. And if the person is not going to buy a television from you, who cares what country he's from? So it's challenging from our perspective to figure out which country some of these users are coming from. Another issue here, I was talking to somebody from Libya who said, uh, the reason why you don't have most of us here is because we use sat phones that pop out as if we're from Italy. So. Hard to know how accurate the data is, but I think the general trend of lots of people deciding they, they need the internet, the internet getting throttled, and then slowly coming back exactly at the times of various political events is pretty interesting. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think that Syria is a particularly egregious example of a fascist state when it comes to the internet. And in fact, you can look at an internet connection in a country and you can sort of tell in general how free the country might be in terms of how people who govern the telecom infrastructure think that people should be and, and, and effectively what regular people are free to do online. And Syria is an example of a place that is so incredibly bad for so many reasons. Some of them are not public. I'm happy to make some of them public right now. One of them is that they actually record every single byte of traffic that goes in and out of the country, which sounds crazy until you remember that not a lot of people have internet access. And with deduplication, it is certainly the case that you can run a TCP dump on those links and record them, and it will not be a big deal. And I actually received some information from some people that built these systems through a Mixmaster relay. And I mean, I'd never received a serious email through an anonymous remailer before, which is pretty incredible. What they seriously do, though, is record everything. So just imagine everything you are doing is recorded, every phone call, every transaction, every email, all this stuff. That's a huge problem if you don't have forward seeker senior protocol and they record everything. Because what it means is if you fucked up your protocol, and there are lots of people that have, and we'll talk about one of them in a second, if you do that and they're recording this, they can retroactively go back, find people, and kill them. And in Syria, at the Arab bloggers meeting in Tunisia, we met a person who told us that they had friends who were cut up into little pieces and mailed to their families in boxes. One guy who posted on Facebook about how he was sick of the revolution, not a pro-revolutionary statement, sick of the revolution and he didn't like the Assad government for the way they were handling it, and a death squad came to his house and killed him. They shot him to death. That's what happens when you're not using these circumvention systems. As they start to get more and more serious about counter-revolutionary things, they will relate technical attacks to the social realities of those countries, and they will murder them. And that's a really serious problem. And I personally won't stand by and let that happen if I can help it. And so forward secrecy is a really important thing when you evaluate a protocol for use there. So here's the graph of people actually using Tor from Iran over the last year or so. You can see in January the little blip at the bottom. And that little dip towards the right, the red one, that is the 18-hour period in which they censor Tor after January. So, And another point here. Uh, as of the past few months, Iran has just passed Germany as the number two country using Tor in the world, which is a pretty serious statement from a lot of people who are being seriously oppressed. And 
So going back to what Jake was talking about in terms of what we should promise, there are really two security properties that Tor provides in terms of anti-censorship, in terms of circumvention. Because we want to provide not only you get to the website, but we also want to provide you have some safety while you're doing it. So there are two components to what we mean by safety. And whenever you're looking at a circumvention tool, you should be evaluating each of these components in the context of that tool. The first one is, how diverse is the network out there? In the, in the case of the Tor network, we've got thousands of relays in a lot of different places, and the more relays we have and the more dispersed they are, the less chance there is for a given attacker to be in the right place to beat the anonymity and learn what the user is doing. So that was the old approach for Tor. The second approach that we've been trying to think a little bit more about in the research world is diversity of users. So if I give you a circumvention tool, and people can learn that you're using it, but they can't learn what you're doing with it, but the only people I give it to are high-profile Iranian dissidents, <clears throat> I've screwed up. I have killed them. We need a diverse set of users. We need a lot of people in Iran not being dissidents, but you filtered my web comics. I don't know why, but I'm going to use this tool to get around the censorship. We need a lot of people in America and Germany and lots of other places all blending together in order to provide plausible deniability or whatever we might want to call it. The corollary there is if there are 60,000 people in Iran right now using Tor, there's a lot of different types of people using Tor there. But if you're looking at Sudan, and there are, I don't know, 20 people using Tor in Sudan right now, we need more people there. We, meet, we need more diversity there in order to be able to make it safe. I think I should tell the FBI story now. OK. <laughs> you know, my lawyer's watching this video right now, I'm sure. Don't worry, not that FBI story. So <laughs> no, 99% of the police make the rest of them look bad. So they're not all bad. <laughs> but, That joke never gets bad because it never stops being true. So it's, it's interesting because I was once at, a, at a, an internet meeting where they were talking about denial of service attacks and about anonymity and you know problems on the internet. And this FBI agent tells me, we don't ever use Tor. We have our own anonymity network. And by the way, criminals are so stupid, you'll never believe how stupid criminals are. And I said, well, that's really interesting. Maybe you only catch stupid criminals. And he said that he didn't quite understand what I meant. And I said, that, that makes sense. And so. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, let's consider your anonymity system here for a second. So you're saying you have an anonymity system that's only used by the FBI, and you only use it for investigation. So I send you a link, you click on the link, I watch where you clicked, what just happened? That's not an anonymity network, that's an FBI, police, surveillance, and investigation network. And his partner walks up and says, yeah, I use Tor all the time, this guy just doesn't get it. <laughs> Diversity of users is extremely important. And, and it's really important. There may be legitimate things that those guys are doing. They will actually have a different, they will have a selection bias, essentially, in what they see on the internet, because their anonymity system fails them. And they don't have a way to close their feedback loop because they're arrogant. And I would never want to be accused of arrogance. So I think it's important to note that using something with a diversity of users might help fix that problem. It might not fix the problem. But probably it fixes that problem, and they have no other answer to that. Yeah, so we see the same story again and again when we go talk to law enforcement and try to teach them about how the internet actually works. We were in Sweden a couple of months ago talking to the guy who was trying to push through the data retention law and another forensics guy who worked for the Swedish government. And the forensics guy waited until halfway through when the first guy was yelling at us and explaining that it's our fault the internet is messed up to say, oh yeah, I use Tor every day for my job. Does, and I used it at home too, shouldn't everybody? And the first guy was... <laughs> looking over saying, I thought you were on my side. I thought we were in this together. Right? And if you guys haven't read the book IBM and the Holocaust by Edwin Black, I really, you know, I think it's a really good thing to, to talk about. Even though machines themselves are neutral, you have to consider what it is that those machines are being used for and what it is that you are starting out to do in the beginning when you are building those machines. And while it might be the case that you think that it's okay to censor, for example, people in a corporation where you're certain it's your property and it's your internet, when that same equipment will end up in a dictatorship, maybe you should consider the relationship between the capitalist employment system and dictatorships in regard to control of information. And maybe it's ethical in one place, 
and it's certainly not ethical in another. And maybe it's actually not ethical in either place, but you have to consider that. Tunisia cannot afford to pay the R&D costs of a surveillance and censorship system for their entire country. They pay $5 million a year or something to Smart Filter just to get a license to do it. So the problem here is not Syria and Tunisia are funding the development of these things. The problem is that Boeing goes to Cisco and says, give us a tool to keep our employees from reading news at work. And at that point, Cisco says, give us millions of dollars and we'll help build one for you. And then once they've built it for Boeing, then they might as well sell it to Tunisia and Burma and anybody else who wants to buy it because they've already got one. So part of the huge problem here is that Western corporations are funding the development of these censorship and surveillance tools and then dictators get them for free. So how do we solve that problem? That's messy from a technical side, from a policy side. Part of what I was thinking about this before, so I was talking to Whit Diffie, the crypto guy, and he said, ah, the, this is easy. You build a list of all the companies that are willing to sell to bad governments, and you build a list of all the, uh, all the companies that are not willing to sell to bad governments, and then you publicize both lists, and then you let everybody decide to go to the second one. The problem is there are no companies on that second list. <laughs> There are no companies that are not happy to sell to any dictator around the world. So I'm not sure how to solve that problem, but we need some sort of answer. So I, I think, you know, I talked about this a bit in my Recon 2011 talk, which there may be, there will be a video online of it at some point, and the slides are available. Um, but really what it comes down to is that corporations have the ability to affect change like even dictators cannot in their own country. Right? So, for example, if you are really good with BinNavi and BinDiff and IdaPro and, and all the rest of this reverse engineering software, which is like incredibly important at this point in time, getting the firmware images, mirroring them for these different companies, really understanding how their software works, finding out what bugs there are, that is great. For example, if there is a bug in a filter, such as in Iran, there was a bug where you could exploit the firmware where you would basically say G space E space T instead of a normal GET request, and it would bypass the filter. Now, this doesn't really seem like it's very important, but what matters is that when that bug goes away, you know that they were patched, and now you know that there is collusion. Now you understand that the deep packet inspection machines are not like a car or like a Kalashnikov. What they are like is a guy with a Kalashnikov who hands it to the dictator, and then when it jams, he unjams it. And when he says, I need a bigger gun, he hands him a bigger gun. When he says, I need a gun that only tailors and only hits bad people, he say, well, what does a bad person look like? We'll design a rocket that specifically fits that. This is exactly what Deutsche Homag did. This is extremely important. What IBM did during the Second World War is identical to what these companies are doing now. And it's extremely important to look at that. So, so here's the question. If you could all go back in time right now and do something about that, would you? This is an honest question. No, no, not clapping, honestly. If you could go back in time, knowing what you know now, would you go back in time and would you set things straight with IBM's punch card systems? Yes, no? Okay, what if you didn't have to go back in time? You don't. These are the people doing it now. And they believe they're doing the right thing in some cases. So sometimes just talking to them will change it. But other times, reverse engineering, dropping bugs on them, monitoring what they're doing, monitoring the sales, just like we monitor arms trades, like Fefe said the other day, it's extremely important to consider these things like landmines. Surveillance systems should not exist. And we need to wipe them out. We have to get rid of them. And we have to do it by showing economically and from a human rights perspective that these things are not OK and we need to change them. So these are the companies. And there are more companies like them. And you can find them. And you should work on that if you have the time and if you have the inclination. You don't have to go back in time. We don't have to wait 50 years to fix these things. We can do it now. And that's what we're working on. So please come join us in that. So speaking of surveillance and censorship, part of the challenge that we had when we were in Tunisia and Egypt and other countries trying to teach people about these things, a lot of people say, 
Yes, I need an anti-censorship system. I need something to get around the censorship. But they don't think if there is censorship, that means there is surveillance. If they are deciding which web page you get to see, that means they know every page you're going to. This is something that as technologists, of course, that makes sense. But for the actual users out there, the people who are risking their lives doing things on those networks, it, they've never thought about it that way. So part of our challenge in education is we need to get them to realize censorship, yes, you can see. If there's censorship, you know you want to do something about it. Surveillance, you can't see, and that's even worse. So we need to give them some ways of not being watched while they're doing something. We find a lot of people who say, well, yeah, I, I couldn't get to Facebook, so I used a circumvention tool. But then they unblocked Facebook, so I just went there directly. That's exactly what Syria wanted them to do when they unblocked Facebook. So part of our challenge is an education effort to teach them about how internet surveillance works. So I think that, I think that it's extremely important, this is our second, slide, second to last slide. So I think it's important to understand, there is a concept, it is called so-called lawful intercept. And I think that it is incredibly important to understand that we choose the world that we want to live in, especially in the so-called free world. Surveillance builds a totally different world. And one thing that we can consider is that we don't want to live in that world, and we can consider it before we live in that world. So when someone talks about lawful intercept or backdoors or delivering the plain text or administrative subpoenas or any of that stuff, what they are saying is they would like to expand the law enforcement capabilities, the so-called lawful intercept. And we must reject that. Like Evgeny talked about in his talk, talking about these surveillance systems, even though censorship is something we can identify with, we can rile against it, we must consider that surveillance, a total surveillance state on the internet is a very serious problem indeed, especially in places where the lawful intercept is put in by request of, say, the American government. When they make that request, Iran gets it for free. They would not be able to build it themselves. It also means that it's possible for other people to use those systems. For example, I believe it was the SNMP bug, where you could specify only one byte was necessary for authentication. And I, I understand that that was actually possible to use against the lawful intercept SNMP interface for authentication. So it's like these systems are designed specifically to spy. So when they so, say so-called lawful intercept, you should read it as spy. And when they say, we need this to do our job, you need to see that they're saying, we want to expand the job we do. We want to make the Stasi look like they had nothing on humanity. Fuck that. Reject it. Reject it, absolutely and wholly. They don't need it. We live for almost the entire history of humanity without a total surveillance state. We don't need one now. Thanks.